Hi, everyone, and welcome. My name is Izzy Kornblatt. I'm not the head of critical conservation. That's George Thomas and Susan Snyder, who unfortunately had a sudden flight change to avoid the blizzard this afternoon. So they're back in Philadelphia, but have asked me to read the introductions that they've written. So I'm going to begin with an overview of the critical conservation program at the GSD, and then um, provide some background information on Swatomiri's work, and then welcome her to the podium. So thanks very much. Critical Conservation is pleased to host this session with the Aga Khan program and GSD's Office of Communications. The origins of historic preservation can be traced to elite resistance to industrialization in 19th century England, to racial zoning in the American South, and to community-based hostility to post-World War II urban renewal and architecture. As practiced in the West, historic preservation is all too often an elite practice. Critical Conservation looks at conflicts over placemaking that often involve the uses and abuses of history. Geographer Doreen Massey observed that underlying the debate about the identity of place are conflicting interpretations of the past used to legitimate a particular understanding of the present that can be wielded as arguments as to what should be the future. By addressing whose history is being told, whose future is being created, who benefits, who is included, and who is excluded, we focus on how issues of social, social justice are applied to the design and continued transformation of places. Our CC students, that, of whom I am one, um, have a wide array of research interests ranging from identity in the post-colonial era, the impact of the transformation of rural villages into urban zones, how cultures are conserved, transformed, assimilated, etc., with displacement, and how UNESCO practices have become institutionalized to replicate the old colonial forces, creating a new empire that ignores local identities. At GSD, critical conservation is not historic preservation in any form. Our goal is to bring critical knowledge to examine the multiple forces that underlie contemporary life and the creation of progressive, vibrant places. We are delighted today to welcome humanist, globalist, Palestinian, architect, writer, peace advocate, and now Aga Khan Prize for Ag Architecture winner, Swad Amiri. Swad Amiri's life has been shaped by the continuing crisis that has been the post-World War II Middle East. Raised in Palestine and Lebanon, she studied architecture at the American University in Beirut with graduate training at the Universities of Michigan and Edinburgh. Since graduation, she has practiced and taught when circumstances permitted, advocated for peace as a Palestinian delegate to Washington, and when life was disrupted, she has written about architecture and life in a war zone. In 1991, when she could not teach or practice, she founded the Rewalk Center for Architectural Conservation that in 2013 was awarded the Aga Khan Prize for Architecture to honor her leadership in a systematic recording and adaptive reuse and rehabilitations of the buildings of Palestine. In most of the United States and Europe, preservation activities are entwined with top-down control and too often are a form of social injustice as elites control their turf, demanding that even the marginalized follow their rules. In places in conflict, conservation can work in the opposite direction, maintaining the evidence and the actuality of marginalized lives into the future. We saw this last year when Nathan Connolly described the activities of the African-American community in Miami to demand their place in the future of their city. In preparing this introduction, I googled Rewalk. Was it an acronym? No, it is a type of place, an arcade around a sheltered space where people can gather shaded from the sun and sheltered from the rain. Louis Kahn argued that the first teacher taught under the shade of a tree. In Palestine, learning lives under the Rewalk. Swad Amiri's Rewalk is a place of learning that uses design to value lives. Her lecture today is entitled, Reclaiming Space, Rewalk's 50 Village Project in Rural Palestine. Please welcome Swad Amiri. Thank you for such a wonderful uh, introduction. I always want people who introduce me to continue because they do a better job introducing me and introducing the organization. Uh, first of all, thank you. I'm really delighted uh, to be here uh, for all the organize organizers and for Mohsen in particular and uh, Paige who uh, did a lot of work. Um, today, I would like to share with you one of my three lives. You know, I uh, so far had three lives. Uh, one of them is as an architect. 
another life as a political activist and social activist. And a third that happened by pure accident, which I call post-architecture, which is writing, and the one that I really enjoy most. And uh, so far, I have been doing a lot of uh, presentation on my writing and very less on architecture. So if I don't do well today, you, have, uh, uh, you know why. Uh, what I want to do uh, today really is share with you uh, Rewak as an organization, but also share with you a particular project that Rewak is working on, a very, very sort of large scale and ambitious project that we have started in 2005. And um, I will do a long uh, slide uh, presentation. So before I lose you with the beautiful slides and you don't look at me or you don't hear about uh, what I'm saying, I want to raise a few issues uh, about conservation. And maybe we can pick them up later in the discussion, because I hope to have some discussions uh, later on. First of all, I want to tell you that I uh, always, uh, I became an architect also by pure accident. I always try to f philosophize why I became an architect. And I will show you in the slides, I say, I became an architect partly because I grew in the city like Damascus, and whoever knows Damascus, my mother is Damascene, and whoever knows Aleppo or Damascus, you can imagine the impact these cities, the alleys, the courtyards, the, uh, uh, the souks that leave uh, an impact on your head. And I also lived in the absence of another city, being Palestinian father. I lived in the absence of a city called Jaffa, that had become part of Israel when Israel was created in 1948. Uh, and as a little kid, as a refugee kid in Jordan, I, my father, my aunts, and my grandmother, or my, the older people in my family always talked about Jaffa. So I always feel that I was constructing models of a city that I have never seen, of a country, Palestine, I have never seen. And I always say that I became an architect because of the very much presence of Damascus in my life, and my mother, who is a very strong character, and the absence of a country and the absence of a city that made me imagine things from a distance and build uh, you know, models of that city. But in reality, if I want to tell you the truth, I became an architect because I am dyslexic. And I'm sure many of you architects here and artists, we don't know why we go to architecture, but a study has been done and showed that there, many of us are actually dyslexic. And it's, uh, it's quite funny that uh, eventually I became a writer, but we'll come to that. Now, the issues I want to raise in this uh, uh, lecture are issues of conservation. First of all, to whom do we preserve and why do we preserve? And uh, um, the issue of the stakeholders, what is the role of a conservation architect? Are we catalysts? Are we the ones who decide what will happen to our historic cities or historic buildings? What is the role or the limitation of our relationship to the local governments? Or most important, what is our relationship to the people who live in these places? Uh, especially that in the case of Palestine and in many other places in the world, these historic buildings and these historic centers are often actually associated and they have become more of slum areas or more of areas where the poor people live and what if the poor people who are living in these spaces tell you that we are not interested in preserving these, partly because they associated with poverty, partly because they associated with dampness, and they want to move into a concrete block or a concrete a new neighborhood, something that we architects feel that it's not appropriate, it's not beautiful. So for me, the most challenging part is our relationship to the people whom we think we are serving. But I will come back to that and see the challenges that we meet. The other issue I would like to discuss with you is the role of an architect as a physical intervention. We architects are trained to think physically, meaning of technical aspect of conservation, of technical uh, design, and actually, what I'm interested in is the non-physical intervention, 
having worked in the area of historic conservation for the last 27 years, I find out that is what is really challenging for us architects are the non-architectural aspect of conservation. In other words, what is the difference between conservation and rehabilitation? Meaning conservation in the technical form. You can become a good conservation architect who know the material, the technology, and what have you. You do a building, but nobody uses it. And then you start thinking of rehabilitation. What does it really mean to bring life back to a place? 50% of the houses in Palestine in historic centers are empty. And the owners are not interested in using it. What are the non-physical aspects of conservation that is challenging for us as architects to be involved in to bring life to this city? And who are the users that we want to bring back? Are they the same users? And so on and so forth. Lastly, I would like to discuss the challenges, the issue of development or lack of development. In the case of Palestine, I find out that since the Palestinian Authority came in 1993, we have more development in the country, meaning there are more buildings. And I will show you some of the um, uh, images. I found out that the lack of development actually is the best thing for the preservation of cultural uh, uh, historic centers. So how do, we, how do we architects deal with this issue that on the one hand development, the private sector becomes very aggressive and they don't care about the cultural heritage from a historic point of view or for that matter to serve the marginalized sector of the population. And you find out that more and more buildings are being marginal, are be, being commercialized or are being demolished. And so what is this uh, dilemma between development and lack of development? And if the lack of development is better for the cultural heritage, where do we stand in all of this? These are some of the issues that I would like to discuss with you later, and they will come in the presentation. Meanwhile, I will start uh, the slide presentation. Uh, I wouldn't, uh, there will be sometimes slides that I will go through them very, very quickly. And I've purposely put them there for those of you who have not been to Palestine, and I'm sure many of you have not been there. Uh, so you get a feel for the place. <coughs> so this is how it will go. Um, first, I would like to show with you some personal notes, and then I will take you on a tour in Palestine. And then I will um, talk about the history of Riwak, how it went from what we call the uh, small bulb into the Aga Khan uh, award, or the, you know, being under the, the light. And then the different phases that we went through. And um, OK, here I am as a little kid, the one, his father's lover, you know, and a normal family in Jordan. And this is my mother in Damascus. I grew in a house that has very uh, big architectural qualities that I think has influenced my, my thinking, which unfortunately had become a restaurant now in Damascus, like most of these cultural heritage projects. And if you live in the alleys of these streets and these old cities, you wonder how our cities now had become globalized and they all look, look alike. And that's why I think it's more important than ever to protect these uh, jewels of cultural heritage everywhere. And this is the city which I imagined from a distance, Jaffa, where my father came from. And for those of you who haven't been to Palestine, I will take you through a quick journey. I don't have to comment uh, on these. This is part of the landscape that is mostly olive trees. And this is a typical village now in what I call minor Palestine. Minor Palestine, I define it as the West Bank and Gaza Strip versus the historic Palestine. The West Bank of Palestine has been the center of peasantry. 50% of the villages in Palestine are in the West Bank. And the architecture of Palestine is divided either into urban architecture, which is a place like this one, which is Hebron and Jerusalem, or some of the houses. These are some of the urban houses you find in Jerusalem, or a little bit more formalistic kind of architecture. 
And actually, right there around the corner, we have three books for those of you who are interested more to know about village architecture, which is my specialty, more than the stylized urban architecture. And this is a city like Nablus. This is one of the villages that Riwak has worked on. And there is something in the village called throne village or feudal architecture, which is another type. This is a typical peasant house and the peasant interior in Palestine, which is mostly made out of mud. And this is like a modernized house of uh, using old kind with new furniture. Now, the story of Rewak from the light bulb to the Aga Khan Award of Architecture. And I, the reason I call it the, the bulb uh, is uh, the following, actually. When I first started Rewak in 1991, I, uh, the first thing I did is just hire, rented a place. And there was nobody in the space, actually. And uh, I, ha with the help of a friend of mine, we published a brochure which looked very, very, very fancy. When you look at it, you think that there are 20 people working in this organization. And I simply asked friends just to distribute it around. And in it, it said the aim of Ruach is to protect the cultural heritage of Palestine under the political occupation, Israel, and all the jargon that you can imagine will bring you some money. And it did, actually. Uh, so I received a phone call from Canada Fund uh, saying we are very much interested in the brochure that we read and we'd like to meet with you. And it was 5 o'clock in the afternoon in winter and it was dark. So I said, OK, I gave them the address and ran and called another friend of mine, another friend architect of mine, and said, come for a meeting. We're going to have a meeting, our first funding. We arrived there, and actually, to my surprise, there wasn't a bulb. There wasn't a light. I put on the light, and there wasn't a light. So I had to rush very quickly, bring a bulb, and put it, and just carry a few two chairs and a small table from the house, and put it, and that's where we met. And that's when we got our first funding. So that's why I always uh, say the history of Rewak starts from the bulb into the Aga Khan Award of Architecture. Um, we are a small organization that has almost 15 to 17 architects. And, uh, and as any other place in the world, trying to protect cultural heritage is not one of the easiest fields. And being in Palestine, the challenges are even more. You have a challenge of the legal protection. We really don't have the right laws for the protection. We have British laws that sort of protect only archaeological sites. And it is certainly not a, a priority for the national government in Palestine. And uh, the confiscation of land and the building of Israeli settlements very close to, you can see the size of a settlement and the size of a village uh, right there. Uh, the wall, the construction of the wall is also another challenge, another threat, because it has demolished many archaeological sites, and it has also taken many of the lands of the villages, but also it had destroyed a lot of archaeological sites. The wall, this is a building in uh, the center of Nablus, in which 2002 the Israelis invaded and demolished part of this historic city, not to talk about war in Gaza, uh, the challenges are really big, and also the conflict with Israel about the character of that place is extremely important. There are political decisions that are taken, both on the Israeli uh, uh, side. This is a typical picture where you have the Wailing Wall with what we call the Moroccan uh, quarter, and there was a political decision on the Israeli side to demolish a whole neighborhood in order to create a plaza in front of the wall. There is also the challenge, the biggest challenge for us Palestinians is the urban uh, sprawl. This is a, a picture of Ramallah, the city where I came from, sometime in the end of the 19th century. And this is what you see in Ramallah today. So the difference between what existed of historic building and what you see today is really, uh, for me, is monstrous. It doesn't mean that this disappeared, but it has been partly destroyed and partly um, um, surrounded. Now, when we started Rewalk in 1991, we really didn't know what we were doing, I must admit. I never studied conservation. I am an architect, but I had no idea 
about conservation, but all I knew that when I studied architecture in the 1970s, I was not really interested in modern architecture, I must say. And the only course that I enjoyed was at the American University of Beirut is a course called Lebanese Architecture, in which we went to the villages and we sort of uh, documented these buildings. And that's the one thing that I always wanted to do, is to work with architecture without architect and also village architecture. So when we started the work, we wanted to know what is it that we have. So the first phase was really documentation. Basically, we wanted to know what we have, so we went around collecting all the patterns, whether they're roof patterns, we have uh, all the tiles. We sort of revived some of these. Uh, oops, what happened here? I think the computer got tired of me. I don't know, this came in the wrong, let's see. Okay. Um, I think I'm having a little bit of a technical problem in here. Anyway, uh, so what we did is basically work on the um, protection or the training. Many of these crafts were gone, for example, the ceilings, the floor. Uh, also, this kind of cement tiles that was gone. This is a typical Mediterranean kind of cement of tiles. We went to the owner, the son of an owner of a tile, and we asked him to come back. And we worked with him. We did research, and we brought back this kind of uh, field. But most important project that Ruak did was the National Register of Historic Buildings. Actually, we did not know what we had. So with the help of architectural students from Birzeit University and other students, for 10 years, we went around 420 villages. And we documented every single house that was built before 1950. That was the cutting edge for us. And we managed in the 10 years, with a project that almost cost a million dollars, to register online a GIS system to register 50,320 buildings and put them online or put them on computer. We have taken photos of them, we have described them and put it with the maps on the GIS and eventually published a three volume book in which you can know and have information about 50,230 buildings in Palestine which are located in 420 villages. And as a result, we also find out that there is a lack of publication in the area of architecture on Palestine. And that's one area we decided to concentrate on. And we have our series of publications. Now, having registered and having known what is it we have, what kind of cultural heritage we have in Palestine, we decided to go into the second phase, which is the year 2000. Actually, we started the actual conservation in 1996, and we started thinking of what is it that we can give to our communities. And we thought the best thing is to have a cultural infrastructure. In other words, we worked in 100 or 120 villages in which we asked the community what is it that they wanted in their communities if we wanted to renovate one building. And we made what we call the perfect marriage. I know such a thing doesn't exist in life, but in conservation in Riwak we did it. And what we did is the following, actually. Um, we tried to combine three things. The owner of a house or a building, the users of that building, and Riwak. Now, if you were an owner of a historic building, we will come and ask you if you were interested in um, giving your house for an NGO that would use it for 10 to 15 years, we will renovate your house without paying a penny. And we will go and ask a women's center or a, you know, any NGO, local NGO, if they were interested in moving from their building, which is a concrete building, into this beautiful historic center for 12 years, also for free. And they looked at us and they thought we were stupid and we were probably so. We took 
on our behalf the responsibility of raising the fund for, for doing the conservation. So let's say we spent 120,000, the owner will give the building for, 20, for 12 years, and the NGO would move in and use it for 12 years. After 12 years, the owner and the NGO will settle between them for a new rent. And this way, everybody is happy. Rewak is happy that we have a historic building. And the owner is happy because he sees or she sees the building renovated. And the NGO is in a nice space that doesn't pay anything. Now, we decided that, first of all, we really didn't have a lot of expertise in conservation. And that's why I decided to have training both for workers and also for architects in the area of conservation. Now, most important for us was that we have to create spaces for change, and we didn't do it alone. We worked with other cultural organizations. For example, we have a group called Kamanjati in Palestine, which is a music group. We would agree with the Kamanjati that they're going to open music centers in different villages as uh, anyway. So we will agree with the music uh, Kamanjati. Why don't we work together? We will renovate the building for you, and you will use it as a music center in these villages. We did the same thing with health groups, with uh, young, uh, um, young people who want to have libraries, with Tamer organization who opens libraries. So we actually twinned with cultural organization in which we try to have all sort of what we call a cultural infrastructure because we were interested actually in conserving a historic center for the use of the community and rather not for a personal or private uh, invention. So here I'm going to show you some of these projects in the different villages. This is a women's center for old women in one of the villages. And this turned out to be a, the archaeology department at Birzeit University. Okay. Now, Having worked on single building for almost um, a number of years, what happened in 2000, if you recall, Sharon, the ex-prime minister or late prime minister of Israel, have made a decision that he doesn't want any Palestinian work workers working in Israel. And as a result, 150,000 Palestinians from Gaza and the West Bank found themselves without any job, which meant that one third of the population in Palestine woke up one day without a job. And we at Rewak felt our responsibility as well, that we have to one way or another contribute to the creation of jobs. So we created a program called Job Creation Through Conservation. And the concentration on the conservation was not really on the technical aspect, but it was rather on the number of people that could be hired in each project. Also, that affected the mechanism in which we do things in slow, in sort of uh, low technology rather than high technology. And as a result, we uh, also, who, the contractor that would take the job, because it's all open tender, is the one that could provide the maximum number of jobs in the villages. So that's the only time, I would say, when the villagers started feeling that they are putting a buck in their pocket at the end of the day. That made, really made the shift in people mind why conservation rehabilitation is important. Before, we used to go and work with the community and tell them about our history, about our identity, about why is it important to keep these buildings. And they were all yawning and really not interested in any of this. And the only time they got interested in the community when they started feeling that they're young men, unfortunately mostly men because the profession, uh, we could hire only architects and few women on the site. Um, when the community started feeling that they're really getting a benefit, they're benefiting economically from uh, the conservation. 
And as a result, slowly, slowly, we decided to shift our focus from a single building of cultural center, creating cultural center, into actually rehabilitating the whole village. And this is when the 50 project, 50 village project came to life. We have decided, because of the national register that I talked about, in Palestine we have 420 villages. When we looked at the fabric, the architectural fabric, we found out that if we actually, because of the lack of human resources and economics, we cannot protect everything, we found out that if we protect 50 villages in Palestine, in Gaza, and the West Bank, we will be protecting 50% of our cultural heritage. And that's why we concentrated on this. Now, this 50, pro, uh, 50 village project is rather, um, as I said, ambitious project. We moved from renovating one bu single building into doing a whole infrastructure for the whole village. Also, we do something called preventive conservation. And preventive conservation, instead of renovating the whole building, I always call it like the hummus, a plate of hummus, where you have a little bit of hummus and you sort of spread it as much as possible on the plate. So instead of putting $150,000 in one building, we started putting $150,000 in renovating, in preventing, meaning just stopping the buildings from deteriorating in such a way that if we came in 15 years or 20 years, we will still find them standing. And that's what we did, but it also improved the quality of the life in the village. We kept the community centers because these were very important culturally for us. And then we discovered that if we start working on public spaces, like creating a piazza where old women or men came around, around the mosque or in the center of town or where women gathered, but we also found out that children playgrounds are magic, actually. If you have a children playground, then the, the family comes, and then you have this nod of activity that is happening. So we started doing more and more public spaces like alleys, piazzas, rather than going into the... Um, now, working closely with the community, I'll come back to that, but that's really the biggest challenge, is who is your partner when you go to the village? Is it the municipality? Is it the village council? Is it the NGOs in the town? Or you know, you get entangled into politics, into religion, and all sorts of uh, uh, difficulties. And I still find that we at Rewak, the most challenging part for us is to work how to deal with the community, how to work with them, and how to make them un, you know, sort of real partners and not a cliche that I will come to Harvard and say we are very good at working with the community. Now, what does it take, actually, to come to bring life into a, a historic center? First, we have to engage in a lot of research, understanding the socio and economic. We have to understand the community, the dynamics of the community. And also, as I said, we have the physical intervention. But in addition, we have the non-physical intervention and the activities in which we have made a lot of activities to bring uh, life into uh, the centers. We also we are, were invited to Venice Biennale, in which one of the artists, Khalil Rabah, took Riwak as the subject of his architectural work. And actually, he took us all as a center into Venice Biennale, in which we sat there and we did our work. We were the subject of uh, the artist's uh, work. And don't ask me what that meant. Now, working with the local communities is really, for me, the most challenging. So for us, we do a lot, a lot, a lot of work with the community, meaning from children having, you know, doing plants with them, cleaning the town, the old village with them, uh, having uh, photographers come and work with them into uh, photographing their town, their historic, just to make them appreciate their spaces. Also interviewing the older people, how they, the history of that place. There is a lot of oral history and or a lot of training, but also a lot of meeting with them and discussing with them what is it that they would they'd like to see in this. We have a storyteller working with the young uh, people. 
Now, our first project of rehabilitation, the one that won the Aga Khan Prize, is the Birzeit um, Center. We took Birzeit because it's very close to University of Birzeit, and we thought it will, has a pot it will have a potential of winning. And what we did, as you can see, we did the infrastructure in which we uh, tried to put the water and sewage and electricity. We did not succeed much with the electricity company, but at least we have everything under it. And then we have cleaned up. What we wanted to do, because the old cities have poorer sector of the population, actually we wanted to improve the old city, the old centers, in such a way that they will have more services than other parts of the city. And this is how we attracted people uh, to come in. And um, uh, this is a case of Dahriye. Uh, and you know, we have so far done almost 20 out of the 50 villages. And I want to mention to you that this 50 village project actually had become international in the sense that many other organizations in the world come and help us and work with us. Uh, we have uh, Arizona Department of Architecture with Mark Fredrickson who came and worked with us for two years. We had Columbia University who came with their students. I'm saying this to encourage you to just plant little seeds here and there in your brains. Uh, we had Columbia University coming and working twice, two years in a row, in which the first time they took a village of their own, and the second time they did Lifta. They were more courageous than I expected them to, do, to be, actually. They went to Israel and took one of the deserted villages, Palestinian villages, and studied it. Again, in this book, you have a book behind on the table that shows the work of some of these students. They were fascinating. Uh, one of the projects that I really loved, Lifta, as you know, when Israel was created, they demolished 420 Palestinian villages. And Lifta was one of the few villages that you can still see it when you go from Jerusalem to Tel Aviv. And what the, the students of architecture at Columbia University did is the people of Lifta live in Jordan and in Jerusalem and in Ramallah, but the people who are in, Jeru in Ramallah cannot reach their town, even though they are just 20 kilometers. And of course, those who are in Amman can't visit it. So what the students did was the following. They went to Amman and one of those uh, projects, and they interviewed the owners of the house in J Lifta and said, would you describe to me your house? How is it? And with the help of the owner, they sat together, and they drew the village, and they drew the houses. Now, this, this clever student of Colombia came back to Lifta and actually drew the village and imposed the two together. One is called the memory of Lifta, and one the actuality. And it was intriguing to understand the psychology of how people imagine how memory works with culture, with your spaces, and how um, you know the, this uh, layout. And there are many interesting. I must say that our cooperation with um, people coming from outside helped us a lot to uh, because each one of us works differently. Uh, I can speak for two hours. I'm not having a record. What? Uh, how much longer can I speak? OK, good. So here I'm going to show you some of these projects. This is how a build building in Birzeit looks like before we started it. And this is how it looks like. You can, as architects, not like the design, but I just want you to focus on how difficult the situation. Many of our funders, and our funders are mostly Swedes and the Arab uh, a fund from Kuwait. Many of this, I remember a Swedish uh, consulate when he came and saw some of this building, he says, Saad, I want my money back. Yeah. And then, you know, when he came back for a reception uh, in this place, he was uh, saying, OK, it was put to good use. We also try to convince the users, because as I said, these old buildings are associated with poverty, with uh, cold, with humidity, and many of these old buildings who were built for a purpose or for a function, that function doesn't exist anymore. What I mean by that, the village architecture in Palestine was built, most of these buildings were built for people who were peasants, who were working out in the field. 
And the houses actually accommodated the person, the peasant, his family or her family, and then the animals and also the agricultural product. What do you do with these same spaces if you want to change them into today's use? So we try sometimes to do uh, model houses, or this is one of the residences of Birzeit University, in which we try to convince the users that it has potential. These are uh, different cities or villages in which we have worked. And so, you know, some of the time they're used, they're used as cultural centers like, like this one. And last, I want to share with you a very personal note. I know that you invited me to talk about uh, Riwak. And actually, I always joke that saying people think that the Arab Spring started in Egypt. But actually, the Arab Spring started at, at Riwak. Uh, because in 2011, I gave up my directorship or dictatorship from Riwak into these two young uh, people who are the directors of uh, Riwak uh, today. And I moved into greener pastures of being a writer. And I must say, for you architects, if I knew how much fun architecture uh, writing is, I would have done it many years ago. <laughs> Thank you. Ah, uh, OK. Ah. You see, as I said, writing is much more interesting in architecture. So the first <laughs> from the dean of. <laughs> no, no, no. But uh, yeah. No, actually, uh, it's funny. As I always say, the last thing I expected to be in my life is a writer. And as a little kid, I loved talking and telling story. And now, Mama, la, 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 I tell the story. Don't say it. I want to tell the story. Or I wanted to tell a joke. And my mother always said, you know, you should just get on stage because, you know, you're, you're good at it. And my father used to say, no, 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 maybe you should become a lawyer because you argue quite well. I wanted to be with animals. I love nature, and I really wanted just to be in nature. And I grew up with a dog who took me to school, brought me to school. So for me, I was more interested in nature. But it was by pure, pure accident that I became a writer. And I always say that I thank two people for becoming a writer. One of them is Sharon, the ex uh, Prime Minister of Israel, who occupied the reoccupied, occupied Ramallah. I wake up one day and I find uh, seven, 13 uh, tanks just right in front of our house in Ramallah. And at that time, my husband, who's in the room right now, was away. And uh, my mother-in-law, who was 91 years at that time, was living next to uh, uh, Arafat compound. And uh, I was on my own. The Israelis put us under curfew for 42 days. And for two, three days, they will lift the curfew. And a town of 70,000 people will just come out of town to shop together. It was a mad, mad house, and really a mad situation. So I decided one day to go and bring my mother-in-law to come and live with me. She was living on her own. And that was the biggest mistake I made in my life. Uh, so I brought her to live with me. And we ended up with, a, 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 I always say, we have an Israeli occupation outside. And we ha I had an internal occupation inside. <laughs> uh, I always uh, say, please don't ask me which occupation was more difficult. But what happened is the following. Every time the Israelis lifted the curfew, 
I would go out and I would be traumatized by the destruction and the death that has caused by the Israeli army. So I will come back and write a story about what I saw that day. And for the coming two days, I would be arguing with my mother-in-law about how to you know, boil the milk, when to eat, when not to eat, and what have you. So whenever she went to sleep, I would write a story about my mother-in-law. <laughs> and <laughs> I ended up actually, I, I didn't think I was writing a book. I was writing emails to close friends of mine, five of them. And I said, please don't share. And Salim was certainly not one of them. And to my biggest surprise, I have an Italian friend of mine, and you know how crazy Italians could be. Next thing I know, she, call, she calls me and says, can I send it to a publisher? I say, you must be out of your mind. And sure enough, she sends it to a publisher in Italy called Filtrinelli. And I should tell you about the phone call I received once. I received this phone call from someone called Alberto from Filtrinelli. Filtrinelli, I thought maybe it's a country in Africa or a country. I had no idea. And then he says, I read your uh, manuscript. I hardly knew what a manuscript is. And yes, and he says, we would like to get the world's rights. It's like, what do you want to get? It's like words rights. What is words rights? You know, like we know elevation, sections, uh, perspective, but we don't know what words rights. And then he says, I want to buy all language, all, lang all languages, the rights to publish it. And then I got nationalistic all of a sudden. I say, OK, but Arabic is not for sale. And there was a long silence on the other <laughs> side. And he says, we're not interested in Arabic. <laughs> I said, OK, fine. And actually, to my surprise, the book was published like 18 languages. And number 19 was, I looked for a publisher. And it was the last language that was published. And as a result, I became a writer. I received a phone call from the same guy, from the same publisher, saying, we need another book from you. Another book they have, another book they have. And actually, I must say that um, this um, one thing I never associated, because really, being an, a writer, I always thought that being a writer, you have to have uh, you know, all the dictionaries. You pile them up. You open them. You look for the best word. You make it very complicated, like sociologists. You don't understand what they're saying. And the last thing I expected is like, if I write the way I speak, I could be a writer. And that's what I did, actually. So uh, that's an answer to your question, I hope. <laughs> I know the first question is always difficult. So if you want, I can ask, uh, ask it myself. I was just wondering if you can tell us a little bit more about your new book. And About, OK. Um, my last book actually is called My Damascus. And we're talking about this kind of book or architectural no, book. No, no, My Damascus. Yes, My Damascus. You see, all architects are not interested in architecture like me. Uh, anyway, My Damascus actually is very different from Sharon and my mother-in-law. My Damascus, because I have a Damascene um, mother, and you know, Palestine takes over, unfortunately. You know, I always say I wish I could forget that I am Palestinian because it's so heavy to be Palestinian. And for the longest time, I concentrated on my uh, uh, father's side, on my Palestinian side. And unfortunately, it took a war for me to realize that I am also as much Syrian. But the story is not about the war in Syria, not at all. The story actually is about a cousin of mine who was adopted by two of my unmarried aunts. One of them is called Suad, after which they called me. And she was the one who ruled the family. And my other aunt, and just to give you a sense of time, my aunt, after whom I was called, was born in 1898. So the story starts from 1862, when my grandfather was born. And I remember my grandfather, and I know him very well. And I was nine years old when he died. So between my grandfather and I, up till now, we covered 150 years. I could easily cover another 200 years. Um, so we, going back to the theme, 
this little uh, cousin of mine was brought up by two women, my two aunts. One of them acted as her father, and one of them acted as her mother. And uh, <clears throat> it was a dramatic story in the family. It showed the dynamics of the family. Those cousins, those uncles who accepted her, and those uncles who did not accept her, not being from the um, you know, noble family or whatever family, and all the pain that she went through. But it was a beautiful love story between mother and child, between a, you know, an adopted child and the mother. And her mother lived to be 90 years old, and uh, when her mother died, she was almost 60 uh, or 62. And to my biggest surprise, I received a phone call when I was living in Ramallah, and she's somewhere in the Arab world. And she calls me, and she tells me, would you help me find my mother? Uh, so, and the story goes uh, into f finding or not finding her mother. But through this story, actually, it's a three-generation story from my father, my grandfather, who is a merchant from Damascus, my grandmother, who is a little girl in a village in Palestine. Uh, so I trace the relationship between the rural and the urban. You know, in the Arab world, we have a lot of tension between peasants and uh, urban people. And there is a part with my grandmother that I love. Uh, she comes from a village called Arrabi. And where her, my grandfather comes to take her, uh, he takes her to Damascus. He puts her in a in a carousa or in a you know a carriage, and he takes her around to show her the new neighborhoods of Damascus. And he says, "You see how beautiful Damascus is. It's becoming to look like Istanbul, which I hope I will take you to one day." And my mother, uh, my grandmother, thinks to herself. She says, isn't it funny? When we are in Arabe, we always think we would want to be like Nablus, uh, which is the, the biggest town closer to Arabe. When we are in, uh, in, uh, in Nablus, the Nablusi call themselves, their city, small Damascus. They want to be like Damascus. And here I arrive to Damascus, and he tells me it's, because it's looking like Istanbul. And I wonder if Istanbul really wants to be like Paris or London. <laughs> so, and also I become very enchanted, actually, with the trips that my grandparents took, with the trips that my mother and father took, and the trips that I cannot take these days. I talk about the shrinking Arab world. Like when my father went to study at the American University of Beirut from Jaffa, he took a car or a, again a carriage, and he went north to what we know Lebanon now. And you know, he used to tell me the story of having dinner in Seda and arriving to Beirut. And I look at myself as to arrive to Beirut these days from Ramallah to Beirut is like, you know, it's easier to arrive to New York or to Boston. Uh, the same thing when my grandmother described the trip she took from Arabe to Damascus, uh, uh, you know, along the Hule and the uh, uh, Tiberius and up the Jordan, you know, up the Umqais. These are different geographies, and I show how we are shrinking time and space is shrinking, shrinking now. I live in a, in a town called Ramallah, which used to have five entrances. The Israelis closed them. They made them two. Here you have a checkpoint called Kalandia. Here you have a checkpoint called Atara. And my world is really going around this little space. And just to give you an idea, in a place like the West Bank, which is a very small space, uh, we have around 700 checkpoints. And I always say, I make a joke, that we in Palestine, we don't buy cars with five gears. They're wasted. Because by the time you put first gear, second gear, you have a checkpoint, you have to stop. Uh, so this is the world that, so for me, this book really, because also my grandfather was a merchant going from Istanbul to Jeddah, Hijaz, Cairo, name it, Baghdad. The world was open mm -hmm. uh, at that time. So I am, and we are living the moment of history now where you can't go anywhere. Yeah. So the book is about this, please. Uh, yes. Uh, 
We, we live in Berzate at least one month a year, and we have been doing this since 2013, and we work for an NGO in the old city. The old we, city of Ramallah or? Uh, yeah. uh, Berzate. Of oh, Berzate, we, ah, okay. We work for uh, Arizona. Ah, okay. And we have noticed that there continues to be difficulty in getting people to move into the renovated spaces. Right, right. And there's almost no commercial life left at all. In fact, I think some are leaving rather than coming. Right. Do you have any thoughts about yeah, yeah, yeah. how to improve this yes. uh, situation? Yes, thank you for posing the question, actually, coming back to the challenges of conservation and challenges. Um, um, this is actually of a big concern to us, the municipality, and what have you. And this is what I was talking about, the challenge that we architects have uh, when the community itself um, does not really associate, uh, does not associate these buildings um, with uh, progress. But more important is the following. First, it really depends on the client, on the partner. Birzet happened to be, even though it happens to be our first project and the one we expected to succeed most, but it did not um, because of the dynamics within the old city. The same thing with the old city of Ramallah. The biggest success we had was in Hebron and Dahriye. And it has to do also with the social economic situation. It also has to do with the uh, composition of who lives in that city. For example, in the city of Ramallah, none of the Ramallah people live there. They are mostly workers coming from Hebron. In the city of, uh, of um, Bir Zaid, we have the problem of migration. Most of the people of, people of Bir Zaid, original people, owners, many of them are living uh, abroad. Now, the one challenge we have faced is, so far, we have been raising the funds ourselves as an uh, NGO. So everything you see here in the 20,000, in the 20 villages we renovate, it took Rewak to bring in the money. Now, what you're talking about is extremely important because we saw ourselves as the catalyst in improving the situation, in making it look better, and then testing how much are the people who are living there willing to put their money into it. Now, it's not a matter of willingness or not, because from the very beginning we said these are uh, people who are poor, have very little money, and the question is, the little money they have, if they have a little bit of money, they're going to spend it on the education of their kids. If they have a little bit more money, they're going to buy a car. So really, the conservation of historic buildings in the absence of any kind of incentives from the central government is becoming very, very, very difficult. Now, the only thing we could move in and doing, and we have done it in some, and some in Birzeit also, we started renovating private houses but under the condition is of equal contributions. How much money you're willing to put, we'll put exactly the same, up to 10,000. We're not talking about big money. And in Birzeit, maybe we got two or three people. In a place like Hajja, we have 20 people. In a place like Dahriya, we had 35 people. So really, it, it's, uh, each town has a different, but it's certainly a challenge. It's certainly a challenge. Thank you. I also have a question about architecture yeah. uh, to give you there. But uh, um, I guess maybe, well, first, it always seems that your writing is very open, at least to non-Palestinians. It is a way to understand what life is like under occupation. But the way you described your architecture is very much about how it's responding or not responding uh, to, to local populations. Mm. How, do, how do the projects of Rewalk express messages outward uh, toward uh, toward Israel, mm -hmm. uh, how how are these projects, uh, let's say, seen by occupation? But also, how how do they express something about Palestine outward? Mm. Or or do, or do you find that not at all part of the project? No, no, it is so much part of the project that I take it for granted. I must say, um, 
No, I, I, I think, first of all, the reason Rewak started is to protect the culture. I mean, when you say the word Palestine or Jerusalem, it means something to everybody in this world. And the biggest disappointment for you is to go to Jerusalem or to Ramallah or any other place and, and find it looking like 100 other places in the world. So it's for us extremely important to protect the different layers that exist in Palestine because this is how we are, who we are actually. And the danger with Israel is the following. You asked me about how the Israelis see it. The danger of Israel, Israelis are interested in one layer. If we talk about archeology, span none of the other layers is of importance. As you saw, you could destroy a whole neighborhood and just to make the Wailing Wall a show. So there is a war between us and Israel on the character of that place, on what is the geography of this place. And for me, it's extremely important that we protect this cultural heritage, partly because we need to know who we are and how we looked like, and also to protect the different layers that we have in that, in that place. So I must say that the work of Rewak actually did resonate a lot um, with many places, with many people who are working in the field of architecture. But I have to put it also in context. Now, the historic centers we are preserving are sitting on not 1%, 0.05% of the built areas. What I showed you, all these high-rise buildings are happening today in Ramallah, and the only places we are trying to work on is this 0.05, and it's being threatened. Because, for example, Ruach is sitting on a building. Now we manage to, to, to succeed in one thing, is to protect these, I mean by law, by the municipal law. So historic buildings like the old city of Ramallah or Birzeit and all of those we're working on, with the municipality, we have protected them. But what does it mean for a place like Rewak to be sitting on a piece of land that is $5 million worth? You have to understand that in the West Bank, we control only 40% of the West Bank land. The 60% is co controlled by Israel. So we are, and from 67 until 93, the Palestinians were not allowed to build, full stop. And we happen to be one of the biggest growing population in the world. So what happened when the Palestinian nationality came and the Israelis let the Palestinians have control over 40%, which is what we call area A and B, in which we have rights to, to build, they took 60% of the land and give us 40%. So this 40% of land became very, very, very expensive. And then for a nation that was not allowed to build for 40 years, all of a sudden it was part of the Palestinian pride is to give permits. And we ended up with disasters because of the pressure of the people, the privates. I mean, it's, a, it's a quite a... Co so more and more, the protection of these islands is becoming very, very uh, difficult for us. And especially with the aggression of the private sector, they don't care. I mean, we have done many demonstrations against one building that has been... So there is a lot of political aspect into what we're doing. It's not all very innocent. Um, hi, my question is about your role as an architect and a writer. Um, from, I am, as an aspiring architect, I sometimes find that architects, because we work with concrete and steel and stones and etc., we have to, we kind of protect our stories from them. We don't really express ourselves. Our own human story or our weakness and vulnerability are not as important as the abstract idea and the concept that we put out there to protect ourselves and make us stronger or more bigger than what we really are. And as a writer, I feel it's really about the personal story, the vulnerability, the hurt, and the pain, and the, everything that's not perfect, and who you serve, and who you write about. And a lot of the stories are not perfect. And, and I wonder how you struggle or 
you know, juggle the two together and one when you have to really present yourself as knowing more or stronger than you really are and the other as a more humane and more intimate. Yeah. Yeah. Um, thank you for the question. Many people who read my, my books actually tell me that uh, they see an architect in the book, so I, I'm not so sure about the separation between the two. And there are often, okay, let me start with the following. Architecture is one thing, conservation of historic buildings is another thing. Building a new building, actually one of the reasons, I only built one project in my whole life, just to prove to myself and to others who said, are you, are you really an architect? This is, you know, like go and see Tel Safa and I am an architect, but I'm not interested in adding a new building because it has my name on it, I am more interested in preserving what exists there. So you have to make a choice also on uh, which uh, side uh, you work on. And I love, by the way, architecture. Don't misunderstand me. But I have made a choice that I want to preserve rather than uh, build. Now, I think that you know when you are a writer, I think we exp the same idea could be expressed in different ways. In other words, pain, war, lo love, loss, uh, um, or obsession, you could do it with words. You could do it with painting. You could do it with poetry. You could do it with social work. Um, I, I think that um, all of these fields are tools of expressing uh, one idea. Uh, so I feel more comfortable with now uh, with um, writing because I think I was born a, a, tol a storyteller and I always liked stories and telling uh, stories. So I find them, um, one thing I realize is really the power of a book, something I never, never understood. I always say, God damn it, I spent like 20 some years of my life doing my PhD and my master's undergraduate here and there and nobody heard of me. And then my mother-in-law comes one night, sleeps with me, and the whole world is interested in Palestine. <laughs> so this really made me uh, wonder about the power of a book or a poem or, or a, a, a art. I think part of our problem, we architects think that we underestimate other fields. This is at least my experience. Um, also with young architects when they go out of the field and talk to the workers, they think they know much more. Uh, so I think my experience taught me the power of other media. Yeah. Last question. Um, hello. And in addition to creating this organization contributing to conservation practice in Palestine, I think you also trained many people. Yes. And then created a very innovative model of conservation practice. In particular, I realize that you have created and cultivated many women leaders mm -hmm. in this role. Mm -hmm. So I like to hear about how did it come about and how are you able to do? And it seems to be you created a model which is just not uh, static, mm. but you, uh, how, how do you say, you uh, train the leaders and then they continue to train next generation. So mm. it has this regenerative aspect of human resources as well as regenerative idea for conservation. I think that's a very important distinction, you, your contribution. So I'd like to hear about how you came up and how you have done it and how you're continuing it. Yeah, well, thank you. I think you have put it uh, in better words than, uh, than I could. Um, the, uh, the issue of women, you know, I am the product of my uh, aunt Saad that was born 18... Uh, <laughs> Uh, 98, a very strong woman, and if you wet, met my mother, you would realize that I am only a product of that uh, lady. Uh, so I think it is sometimes rather than words is practice. Uh, you know, I was never uh, known to be a, an open, uh, talkative uh, woman rights uh, activist, but I always felt that I could have probably, or maybe, I don't want to sound pompous in any, any way, but I remember that many of the architects, male architects, um, when they go to the field and they don't like something that the contractor has done, and then they will ask him, please change this, I don't like it. He wouldn't, but then he says, 
Well, Saad wants you to change that tile, and they would. So he would come back and say, oh my God. Now, I want to tell you something about what we call sometimes what describe as conservative uh, societies. I always wondered why the workers listened to me so much. And one day I came to visit my mother-in-law, and the owner of that building was building another house. And the owner actually was a woman from uh, a very simple peasant woman from El Biri. And she was t standing on the wooden scaffolding and uh, with her embroidered, you know, traditional dress, the peasant dress. And she was telling the workers, no, do this, not that. And I looked at her and I understood immediately. What happened is the following, that at the turn of the century, of the 1920th century, many of the villagers actually left their village in Palestine and went to America, the both Americas. And women were left there, and actually the man would only send the money. And it was the woman who sat there and built these houses and gave the workers the instructions. So the workers in our part of the world are very much used to having women telling them, do this or don't do, don't do that. It took me a while to realize that I come from that culture, and that's why the, man, the workers uh, actually listen to me. But there is also a very intentional. When I left uh, Riwak, I made a decision to uh, leave. They asked me, the young one, two directors who were my students, and they asked me, what is your legacy that you would like us to keep in this organization? And I said, I want to make sure that there is always more, at least 60% of the employees of Riwak are women, one. Second, I would like to keep this tradition of co-directors because I had a co-director together, we worked, and I find co-directors a little bit problematic, but for the children it's better. They have a mama and a dad, so they know where to go. Sometimes they know Saad will not accept this, they will go to the male director. So I said I would always like to you to keep the co-directorship, but that co-directorship could be a man and a woman, but never two men. Two women, it's okay. <laughs> but two men, that's my legacy. So some of it I did by practice, some of it I did by coming from a certain culture, a certain family without really too much words into it. Thank you. Thanks.